grown by leaps and bounds in the last 10 years. Antimicrobial resistance has fueled the need for automation and microbiology, and it also fueled the growth of this branch in lab medicine. So the role of microbiologists is no longer confined in just signing culture reports, but it is right from guiding a clinician in deciding which test to perform in a particular case scenario, to managing sample collection, to interpreting sensitivity reports, guiding a clinician in choosing the appropriate antibiotic, interpreting MIC values in different case scenarios. Uh, importantly, now microbiology has moved out of the lab. So we have microbiologists who are heading hospital infection control committees and formulating infection control policies and formulating antibiotic policies. Let me now introduce the first speaker for this workshop, Dr. Bansidhar Tarai. Dr. Bansita Tarai is a senior consultant microbiologist at Max Super Speciality Group of Hospitals in New Delhi. He is also the coordinator for microbiology services across Max Group of Hospitals. He is an MD in microbiology from PGI Chandigarh. He is an active member of infection control and plays a leading role in developing and implementing antibiotic policies for the Max Group of Hospitals. He is a recipient for several uh, prestigious awards and has significant contribution towards infection control and patient safety. He is an active member of Hospital Infection Control Society of India and executive member of IAMM. He is a technical assessor for NABL and internal counselor for NABH. He is going to speak on standards and updates in microbiology culture. So may I invite Dr. Bansi to speak. Thank you. the microbiologist uh, should know about the microbiology culture related things like the pre analytic errors so or even pathologist most of the uh, lab also the pathologists are uh, the lab head and all the microbiologists even report to them so unless the pathologist know what are the lacunae of microbiology maybe in the culture uh, sampling or pre analytic things or in reporting so it's it will change the microbiology reporting or patients, especially patient reporting. So, before we will start, I think we should introduce ourselves, so that we can know much better our discussions will be much uh, one to one, any time we can have our discussions, all the queries related to our topics or in related to microbiology, cultures or sensitivity. So, Sai, from you, I think we will. Yes. Uh, I am Dr. Shripad. I am assistant professor in department of microbiology at Lokmanya Tilak Municipal Medical College, Sai and Mumbai. And I also practice as freelance consultant in for microbiology and infection control. I am Dr. Dineshna Shinde. I am a senior microbiologist at Jupiter Hospital and also have a private practice in Dumbri. Right. I am Dr. Arti Sande. I am senior microbiologist in Jupiter Hospital, Thane. Right. Right. Myself, Dr. Sanghi, pathologist. Right, sir. Sir, so, from which? Uh, Hospital or lab? No, my own lab. Okay, sir. Right. Right. Microbiology. Okay. Good afternoon, all of you. I am Colonel Dutta. I have come from uh, Odessa all the way to attend this conference. So, which uh, college? I am looking after uh, section hospital based. Army? Yes. Which? I have done a DNB in family medicine, but I have been told to attend this conference. Right. Bhuvanesha, na? So, I am also from Bhuvanesha. I know, I could have Answer, yes, Dr. Swas. Okay, we will introduce answer. Hi, ma'am. So you are microbiologist, right? So I'll be mainly uh, covering the basic uh, problem and the basic initially the pre-analytic how we report the microbiological culture report and what are the problems we face normally even like the samples are coming from so far like in like in your lab sir and the how difficult uh, in transportations or collections or 
to our reporting of our results also. All are most important that is why I will cover that part and sir I will say uh, tell about more of automation identification and sensitivity. So, basically the microbiology quality is goes beyond technical perfection into the account of speed, cost, usefulness or uh, mainly the clinical relevance. Actually our microbiology field is last grown from the last few years because of this HNN1 and the infection control issues or the and the most important even in the pathologist and microbiologist has uh, come up with much in the last 5 years or 10 years because uh, we have a very close relation with the clinicians. Initially we do not discuss, uh, we only report out the culture report and the clinicians see the report. Now the things has already been changed. Like in my hospitals, we have a very good clinical discussions rounds whenever even the pathologist as well as microbiologist. That way, that is why our pathology or lab medicine has improved a lot. To be a good quality of diagnosis test must be clinical relevant. Whatever we release the reports, that has to be a clinical relevant. Suppose we release a report and uh, that is patient is not clinically symptomatic everything that is normal. So, that will be not give a much impact to the patients as well as the clinician will be not happy. But same reports if there is a patient is already symptomatic or some uh, sepsis or UTI or in that case and even also we inform to the doctors ki yes this is the blood culture come positive, gram strain is coming gram negative, you can start, you can give us some clue so that the doctors will start the antibiotic or treatment much much earlier. And that way our friendship is has gone so much in deep, you cannot Im remember, imagine even the all the directors they give you a call before prescribing any antibiotics to the, especially in the BIP patients or in the doctor's child patients or doctor's family patients, definitely they take our concerns. And then like initially they are even clinicians scold us lot of time, but nowadays they do not scold much, I mean hardly once or twice they do not scold. So, all depends on the microbiology quality. So, it's re, it is reliability the test results should be correct. The reproducibility is the same result obtained when the test is repeated also. Speed, speed is also important in microbiology. Initially we are thinking only the biochemistry and pathology, hematology are uh, required the earliest. Even microbiology, they, the test report they want as quickly as possible. And cost benefit ratio is also important uh, in relation to the patients and the community. So, the most important factor that decides on the microbiology quality is the specimen. If you get the right specimen, good specimen or the specimen from the site specific if there is an infection inside the deep and if you will get the sample from the surfaces or the there is a wound infections and you will get the samples from the surfaces, definitely all your cultures, all your correlations everything will go well. So, all most important quality in microbiology, I am not talking about pathology, but in microbiology specimen is most like in the histopathology also both in microbiology and histopathology I think the specimen is the most important factor deciding in the quality of microbiology report. The method, the time of sampling, the time of sample is very important and how you collect the sampling or the source of the specimen are often outside the direct control of the laboratory. The, the microbiology or pathology they do not know how the sample has been collected from there, from how much distance it covers like after how much hours the sample are being processed. So, the laboratory is not much aware of the sample collection and this sample collection have a direct impact on patient reports. The transport, identification, storage, preparation, processing of specimen which decides on the quality. So, I am just highlighting the algorithm how we test the microbiology. Patient come either in OPD or in the wards or ICU patients with all these clinical symptoms and then we take the samples and transport, then transport and with proper labeling. Labeling is very more important and then specimen clinical information patient has taken previous antibiotic or not that is most important. If catheterized samples they have to mention it is a catheterized samples because catheterized sample has more of 
contaminations, you will get lot of contaminations. Even the blood cultures, if they are taken from the central line or peripheral line, all are less should be uh, should be there in the TRF. Then storage, then microscopic evaluation order. Any patient sample comes, whenever we put in the culture, we do or either routine like urine or in the gram stain. Unless we see the gram stain, we are we will not able to report the culture correctly. Correctly in the sense it is a significant growth or yeah, insignificant growth all depends on the gram stain post cell report. Without post cells you cannot report the respiratory sputum samples, without urine, all, urine, urine post cells also you cannot report the urine culture report. Either patient will or patient do not will, your culture report will not correlate unless you do the basic gram stain or the urine routine. So, microscopy interpretation, culture, choice of the medium, temperature, atmosphere, isolation of pure cultures and the most important is the isolation of the pure cultures. Whatever you do the identification sensitivity, unless the isolate is pure, the report will be invalid. Maybe the sensitive will come resistance and how you will know that also whenever you putting the identity and sensitivity, then just put one drop of that remain, remain of the remnant of that uh, culture broth in the sterility plates. So, then identification interpretation and the finally, the final report as per the turnaround time. The most important thing is that clinical relevance of microbiology reports. Clinical relevance can only be ensured when there is a good communication between the microbiologist and the clinicians. This is most important whatever you do the culture report that is not the end unless the same thing is passed on to the clinicians. Proemptically even also before releasing the reports you can speak to the doctor. Like in an example if you have few colonies of gram negative rods are isolated from the sputum or throat swab of a hospitalized patient there is no need for further identification or antibiotic susceptibility because it is the few gram negative in the throat swab these are the normal flora. Similarly, if E. coli is isolated from the diarrhea especially non bloody diarrhea there is no need for identification or sensitivity of reporting you all know this is the basic theory of microbiology. So, what I will cover is that mainly I will cover this aspect of this most important samples like the sputum, urine, CSF and blood mainly I will cover the blood about this specimen approach, how we take the samples, how what is the rejection criteria, correct sampling, then what are the interpretations of the culture, urine culture report and the gram strains, what about like this, the pre analytic as well as the culture report. So, most important sample is the sputum, because this sputum sample has very limited diagnostic value especially in the OPD patients or even IPD patients if the sample is not proper because they usually got contaminated with the respiratory flora basically the oral flora. Only extremely useful in ill patients of there is a very high like significant pathogenic organism in that cases it is very significant. And how you know the sputum sample is good or not uh, good basically you can see by, by visibly it is a saliva sample that is ok you can reject the samples or not. But the most important is the gram stain and you have to do a gram stains and you have to see in the low power field every sir every sputum sample has to be seen by the gram stains and that too in the low power field. In the low power field you have to see how many post cells are there, how many epithelial cells are as a common practice there should be a plenty of post cells and there will be a minimum number of epithelial cells. If there is a plenty of epithelial cells that means, it is a salivary samples whatever E. coli clepsilide grows. So, that is a basically a normal oral flora that will not affect the treatment in the patients even that will give a lot of misuse of antibiotic nature and this gram strain has to be any sputum culture gram strain has to be there. Uh, you cannot you do if you not do even the wound swab that is also ok, but we do but sputum gram stain is very important to screen out the post cells and the epithelial cells otherwise you cannot report the sputum samples. 
specimen accepted or rejected basis on our clinical uh, sites procedures large amount of squamous epithelial cell indicates are poorly collected sputum specimen if there is a large color sputum samples uh, epithelial cells we usually do not process if we process we write this is uh, of insignificant growth and more of a normal flora organisms normal oral flora organisms. So, initial specimen gram strength may be helpful in determining the significance of isolates presence. Good sputum sample contain many polymorphonuclear cells and there are few squamous epithelial cells. Keeping in the mind of concept of the normal upper respiratory flora. Several suspected pathogen can also be considered as a part of the normal respiratory flora in small amounts. Even small number of colonies also we do not report. Stop identifications. Please do not identify or please do not give sensitivity report because only if you will give the sensitivity reports, then clinicians has, will start the antibiotics. He will not wait, uh, he will not correlate with the, he want to give some antibiotics, they want some reports from the lab or microbiology, uh, that is why they have sent the samples. So, how we report? I am saying uh, if there is a good number of epithelial there are few epithelial cells, then you report like rare growth, if there is a colony count is very, if they are restricted to first quadrant or few growth, yeah, moderate type of growth, yeah, many growth, that means many means significant growth. If there is a growth of full four quadrant, then you give a significant growth, but that is keeping in the mind the background that there is a high number of post cells in the gram strain, in the low power field, but we have divided uh, like we have a 10 less than 10, 10 to 25 more than 25. If the post cell is more than 25, then we process. If the squamous cell is more than 25, we do not process or we write uh, insignificant more of a respiratory flora. But at least in clear cut, high number post cell has to be there, low epithelial cells there. Then you report sputum culture report. Otherwise, this sputum or uh, respiratory culture report will be cause a lot of problems. So, example how we report the sput, uh, sputum culture. So, initial specimen gram strain, there are moderate epithelial cells, few WBCs, many mixed gram positive, gram negative. In most of the gram strain, they report gram positive cocaine pairs, chains and gram negative, few gram negative. That is not a, that is the initial report, but culture it, it will come uh, alpha hemolytic streptococci, non hemolytic streptococci, moderate gram negative diplococci all this Nigeria, then we usually report many normal respiratory flora present, could be a, is a not a part of routine respiratory culture. That also you can write or you can write a normal respiratory flora, most of the time you cannot reject because patient already build OPD, then a lot of difficulties, wherever in the IPD we take the repeat sample that is assay, but if the samples are coming from outside we cannot ask uh, give another samples. In that case, you, but you can mention these are the upper respiratory flora and uh, has not much significance. So, that you can write in the interpretation part, unless you write clearly, then that will be a, uh, the report has of not much significance. So, like uh, I'll, uh, this is a question like when a sputum culture exhibit a small amount of growth of multiple organisms such as alpha hemolytic streptococci, coagulase negative staphylococci. Nigeria species should this growth be considered normal flora or as a potential pathogens. So, definitely there is a normal flora because all this. So, we do not report candida, coagulase negative streptococci and alpha hemolytic streptococci in the sputum. We do not even in bile sample also in the tracheal culture also with these three organisms also CDC okay, do not report this candida also respiratory they are normal flora we do not report. Similarly, urine culture collections. So, so main is the midstream urine culture, catheter also they collect, but they not recommended much, but it is catheterized samples, the collection has to be proper from the top from the hub, top of the hub or supra pubic aspirate. We do not accept the urinary catheter tip culture, that is a reject, rejected samples. Then urine transport or storage, transport urine lab as soon as possible and culture should be within 2 hours 
or 2 to maximum 4 hours preferably within 2 hours. But if you, are, uh, you do not have facility then you can keep in the refrigerator or cold pack, but the sample should not be more than 18 hours of collections. Suppose today you collect, tomorrow you process, even if you keep in the refrigerator that is not acceptable. Maximum 18 hours you can keep in the freeze, after that you cannot keep, that is another important. And the la this is the responsibility of the laboratory or the hospitals to provide the sample container to the patients. It is not the patient who will got the and the that is a sterile screw cap container and leak proof. Most of the times when the samples came to the lab that is leakage, there is a one drop of samples. So, be careful when you sending the samples. Even samples from the OPD also sending to the lab, there should be a blotting paper uh, in the so that if there is a spillage or the there is a blo observant blotting paper should be there. And whenever possible urine specimen for culture should be collected in the morning, but any time the sample can be collected not a problem preferably in the morning is what they say. Suppose if there is a this is a urine culture kit with the boric acid, suppose if the sample is transferred from the far sir, if the sample is collected from the so far like it is not cannot be reached within 2 to 4 hours, if this is a boric acid container uh, it do not cost much and that boric acid prevent the multiplication of the organisms. So, this the sample will be preserved and uh, this is my recommendation this should be used where there is a like the chain of laboratories this this has to be there. Uh, there are I think 2 to 3 companies, I think BD is there, I think uh, Grenier or something is there, they have hardly 10 to 12 rupees I yeah, do not think, looking, but, uh, I but I have my one of my students, I think uh, this I have done 6, 7 years back, one student has trained, there are lot of significant improvement in the urine culture reporting, hardly 10, 12 rupees I think not more than 15 rupees, whenever the sample outside of the hospital chain of laboratory, you just ask for the boric acid uh, kit this will definitely lot of difference. I have that my the I do not have that presentation, but this has made a lot of lot of misprora, overgrowth everything will be restricted even 10 to the power 3 if the sample transport is long then it will come sir 10 to the 5. So, this whenever any chain of laboratory I think 15 rupees ok if we will got I think this they will give both the combined and the boric acid tube, once they collect the samples, then the boric acid uh, tube will be if will insert then the sample will come, this is around 4 ml. This is from BD, right? BD I think, this is a BD, Grenier also I think they have, those who are vacutaners supplying they are also supplying this container. And interpretation of urine culture, this is also important. So, meanwhile if you have any question also you can ask me. So, that will be more interactive and that time also you will suppose in the sputum culture you have any doubt the last few any report which is confusing you can ask also even urine culture whatever any time. Yeah. Right. No, next best thing is that catheterized samples you can collect, but there is a hub. So, we have an yeah sample port from the top of the port you have to clean the catheter and you take the take in the by syringe put in the urine control. But there is a another catheter available, this is I think the 300 something cost uh, uh, 200, there is another catheter as well which is, that is called a unometer. They have a separate hub for the sample uh, urine sample collections. In the ICU patient we are using, those who are long term hospitalized patients we do use unometer, that is a same catheter not Foley's catheter, that is a one type of catheter unometer, where is a separate hub, there are third hub, where you can directly collect the samples, this is the uh, from the top. So, in sometimes what happens when you are collecting the samples, the needle sometimes one patient we have uh, in the last six years got the pre with the patients. So, so, you have to collect from the catheterized samples only. Just clam the catheter. You yeah, clam the catheter. Collect, yes. Just collect it like a vini puncture. Vini puncture and uh, that is. Invariably, you will get growth. 
you do. No. If you, you have if you have to collect like this, you have to climb from the top, the, the below hub and then collect properly. Why the, we go to maximum from the hospital patient catheter sample, but the tip tip catheter tip is not acceptable. Any tip also, oh, we see even CVV tip also we have discouraged. Even the NABL also say these are non-human samples, so discouraged. So. Uh, what I am saying is, sir, like in the sputum, gram stain is very important, urine routine post cell is very important. Uh, if you are not, uh, patient has not billed for urine routine, we just do a post cells. Our, I would tell my staff before my report, the post cell has to be there in the, uh, in the register, it is, should be written, so that we can give a clear cut report. Gram stain is very important, but we are not practice much. Suppose in one, but the gram stains usually they do the samples directly uh, from the urine sample without any centrifuge, take a one drop and uh, do a gram stain. But if gram stain, if someone is does, it is very definitely much better than urine routine. And one or more bacteria is equivalent to 10 to the 5 colony. From the gram stain, you can see the significant bacteria 10 to the 5 start. A taking treatment, but gram stain is very difficult. So usually we don't do much. But if a gram stain is gram negative, and second is the presence of one or more leukocytes for oil immersion field. That means it is a perfect indication of UTI. Even in the gram stain, you can say start treatment. What we are doing in our lab is that whenever we uh, put a urine, we are using one microliter loop. So it's not going to detect colony is less than 1000. Yeah. Okay. But many times you have UTI with less than 1000 count. So, whenever we are reporting a urine where you do not find any growth, but there were pus cells or the patient was clinically symptomatic, right. then what we do is we centrifuge and that deposit we plate also and we look for microscopy also. And we then can find pus cells, then some gram negative bacteria or maybe many times enterococci do not give you a growth next day, uh, colony count is low. And then from that deposit we pick up, we follow and then say colony count less than 1000. Yeah. And we are also putting antimicrobial substance, I do not know how many labs. Uh, antimicrobial are AMS. That gives us a lot of clue for interpretation. Suppose the patient is already on antibiotic. It is a very simple thing, just you take a, uh, yeah. a long growth of the your uh, control organism E. coli, divide it into cubicles okay, and each urine sample just put one drop into the square and label it. Next day if you find an inhibition of your control organism, the patient is having an antimicrobial substance in his urine. So, we always correlate our culture results to presence of antimicrobial substance. If and sometimes in that inhibition zone you find a growth. That means the patient is taking antibiotic but still growing the inadequate uh, antibiotics. Yeah. So at least you can answer uh, patients or the physicians. Say the physician will complain there is a high number of persons. Why your culture is not growing? Yeah. So but you can say we have put AMS. You have antimicrobial substances. You can say the plate. You have patient is on antibiotic. You cannot because most of the samples coming from outside. They do not write a patient is on antibiotic or not. If you do AMS, that is an extra, that is a very good thing, it is extra, but you have answer. Postal is high, growth is not coming, clinician cannot blame you, he, you have not done properly the culture because patient AMS is positive, antimicrobial substances. This is on MHA, same MHA. You can use MHA, you can use your E. coli, uh, it is At least those who are high postals are not growing anything. You can. Any for this? AMS, there is a guidelines. AMS, there is a, there is a guidelines. And, and this method is also described in your. Uh, no, no. AMS is a guidelines, but uh, like less than 3, 10 to the power 3 by centrifuging, that is basically just to help, but there is not much guidelines. But AMS, there is a guidelines. If you want to see patient is on antibiotic or not, you put the urine drop in the MHA, and definitely there will be a zone. And, and they definitely you correlate there is no culture growth. What happens? Patient goes to the clinician. The clinician prescribes an antibiotic, and but asks the patient to go for urine culture before taking the antibiotic. Patient has already taken a couple of doses of antibiotic, but then he also goes for urine culture. 
what happens is that the bacteria are, are uh, not there, but pustules is still there. So in a recovering or improving UTI, you have pyuria, but you don't have bacteriuria. So when we find good number, good evidence of antimicrobial substance and significant pyuria, but no growth, we very confidently report. This is, uh, the, the interpretation is, this is a UTI recovering under effective antimicrobial therapy. Patient is on antibiotic therapy, can write. Patient is on antibiotic therapy. So, urine routine, even on centrifuge, we take more than 10 parcels, even 5 to 7, they are saying is also significant. But more than 10, definitely there is a patient on infections. And nitrate positive, we do not do nitrate, but some guidelines also say nitrate positive. So, there are three category of reporting like uh, 10 to the power 3 colony forming UTI or less than this basically. Report, report as probable or absence of UTI, insignificant growth, if there is a partial less insignificant growth, except like suprapubic urine, symptomatic omen and high partials. If there is a patient on symptomatic, also 10 to the power 3 is significant. If a high partial, it is definitely significant there is a partial is 0 to 1 and 10 to the power, you can straight away write insignificant growth, there is no need for any antibiotics unless patient is symptomatic or something. Patient is symptomatic high partial or ciprapubic urine, definitely it is significant, otherwise it does not have more significant. Category 2, 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 colony forming unit per ml, if the patient is asymptomatic, request a second urine specimen and repeat the count, that you also can do. If the patient is symptomatic of UTI, proceed with the identification sensitivity. If there is a patient is asymptomatic, even there is no need for going for identification sensitivity, but we do, we do all identification sensitivity, but give a comment, please correlate clinically or there is no need for a further treatment if there is a patient is asymptomatic. And if more than 10 to the 5, the bacterial counts would definitely we go for ID sensitivity, we have to go. Sometimes even in the transportation also it takes much time, but 10 to the 5 we are giving means we have to give the identification and sensitivity, that is a must. So, why would asymptomatic have a colony count of 10 to the 5? Basically pregnancy, uh, what the guideline says in the pregnant lady, if the colony count is 10 to the 5 asymptomatic, there is a high chance of pyelonephritis. And once pyelonephritis, you know, it will then affect the baby and all this. Uh, so, there is a guidelines, like in some forum in the even Noida also, the gynecologist association, if there is a symptomatic bacteria, they start the antibiotics from the day, third month, third month to the end of the delivery. So, that time I told you there is no need to give an antibiotics. Then, then uh, there is a uh, international guidelines, well, if we have, do not have any antibiotics in India. Most of the antibiotics is resistance. You do not have a oral antibiotics in your urine culture report. Most of them are injectable. How much injection you will give to a pregnant lady? So, they have there is a fight. So, they have invited me as a speaker. So, you are saying you are talking against our principles. So, I have given an example one of my friend's wife, high parcels, they ultimately is coming uh, culture positive, have never treated and safely normal delivery. I told them. So, you cannot give, we will not listen, we will follow our guidelines. So, no one we can be the gynecologist. See, there are only two indications for treating asymptomatic yes. bacteria. One is pregnancy and other is uh, before urologic surgery. So, if your patient is, uh, is, is going for a urologic surgery, Proceed. then any amount of any count, colony count is significant. And also asymptomatic bacteria is found in extremes of age. Yeah. See, basically, you know, see, lot of things, old is the more than 65 years, more than 60 to 70 percent lady, like basically the more than 65, they will come high persons. This is a routine, more than 60 to 65 old age group will have a urine persons high. So, bacteria will be high, unless patient has symptoms, patient has symptoms, it, otherwise, you do not do it. There are high, even the I should not tell their name, but there are uh, even lot of uh, artists, senior artists who uh, like even they also treat under me. They do not go to nephrology, they 
come under me for a regular for the for the. So what about diabetes? What about diabetes have got asymptomatic? We don't treat. No, from our side we know. Unless it patient safety. Bacteria, bacteria will be there always, no, as a normal flora. If we treat, see so what is the end? We do not have any antibiotic, only cholesterol will be there. So, what to do? Then patient automatically will not take cholesterol. You have a oral antibiotic, that is why you are giving. But if you do not have a oral antibiotic, then clearly in all guidelines only two indications before urologic surgery and Definitely, we have to see as you are saying, clinician is saying less than 3 years, you have to report. See, they have a very panic. You have to write report, but in say give a comment. There is an insignia board. You cannot uh, report because, see, sometimes what will happen? We, uh, yesterday, only uh, even uh, one of our staff, uh, 4 months baby, and uh, like clinician sent urine culture 10 to the 3. No fever. So, I say do not, no, no need for treatment. And uh, even the gynecologist I told me no need to treat. So, they will not treat, but you have to report sometime because uh, clinicians are saying, but you give a comment, strong comment, so that they will not treat. So, what about pediatric collection? Yeah. That is a very uh, important Indian Academy of Pediatrics seems to have specimen bag that can be that is the bag, yeah. that is the bag uh, neonatal bag. So, we are collecting the bag only. So, see how to practice is important, very difficult, but the treatment is important unless patients is symptomatic, we do not treat. Symptomatic in a child can be fever as well. Fever, the fever. The child may cry during urination or may not cry. Ah, like fever, 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 lot of things like even, even fever also patient definitely crying or some uh, like irritation or whatever may be, it will be there. Clinician can see there is a symptoms of it. So, you have to write a comment. So Definitely, you have to write. See, you are a microbiologist, you have to, you do not want uh, to report, you do not want the patient to treat the patient. You want, then you have to strongly write, both in respiratory as well as in urine, a strong comment. There is no need for treatment also you can write, unless there is a high indication of clinical indication. That is why one of the process step word antimicrobial stewardship, where we can come down the use of higher antibiotics. Similarly, in CSF, we all know there we collect the CSF in four tubes, for one is for chemical and serological test, second is for microbiological examinations, third is for cytology and fourth is for cell count or DLC. Sometimes we get to two or maybe one for microbiology, one for uh, rest of the things and process quickly within one hour to prevent cellular degradation. This is another important key within one hour you should process. These are the typical CSA findings of meningitis mainly um, bacterial, viral, fungal and tuberculosis uh, and uh, mainly the protein elevated usually normal variable, non differential proteins, but sometimes this all these findings may be normal you will get tubercular meningitis or the viral meningitis. It is basically a typical pattern of biochemical, but sometimes it varies. Lot of viral encephalitis as normal, everything is normal. Even the clinicians who have MRI is also normal, but there will be a definitely HSV1 positive. These are the very small gram strains where you can cleanse the diagnosis, like Neisseria meningitis. This is a gram negative diplococci, streptococcus pneumonia, diplo gram positive diplococci, hemophilus in a very small uh, 
uh, pleomorphic gram negative cocobacilli you will get in hemophilus infringi, listeria monocytogens, gram positive bacilli. Now, the uh, I will focus on the paired blood cultures. The blood culture is uh, most important and uh, and we practice uh, like I remember in, uh, when I joined Max. So, I started the paired blood culture concept. So, I approach uh, to the CO also ki keep the normal blood culture and paired blood culture rate same. So, that everybody has encouraged to. So, from that day our paired blood culture single blood culture rate has same. Even in OPD, IPD, ISU everywhere they send paired blood cultures. If you are getting two blood cultures in same price, definitely they will give paired blood cultures. Our practice is that we practice uh, aerobic and aerobic. Only anaerobic when there is an indication. Basically, in surgical patients, emergency or in neonatal things. Otherwise, most of the case aerobic and aerobic. Venous sample is preferred, but if there is a pair, definitely one from central line, one from the venous. Catheter uh, like arterial line, these are the peripheral catheters, we should be avoided. Only central catheter is acceptable. And 10 ml from adult, 1 to 5 ml, uh, preferably more from infants and children. But whatever study we have done, uh, we have also published a pair blood culture article. Average the 5 to 6 ml, 5 to 7 ml, they send the blood volume uh, for blood cultures and bottles should be reached the lab at the earliest. If, uh, there, is, uh, if there is no central line, then paired blood culture means two from separate uh, periphery, two separate venipunctures, separate venipunctures. one venipunctures. from yeah. even two separate, one from left, one from right. Yeah. Wouldn't one venipuncture where 20 ml would suffice to 10 ml? So what is the so what is the why so why no no more volume means in one bottle even CDC say up to 40 ml you can put but we don't have space but uh, one by one two bottles that will not help why then you have to understand what is the concept of air blood cultures number one number one is that suppose in the uh, one manufacturer you got the coagulase negative star so do no may aega we no, no, we lot of cases we come uh, coagulation negative in both the blood cultures. Patient is not center line, patient is not long term patients in the IPD or in emergency. So, we go as nursing staff must have taken in one and put in the both. Will they accept your See, lot of difficulties, see yes. definitely lot of difficulties, but the, the things has to be encouraged. If somebody is giving, why not? We have to do to the patients. Most of the time, they refuse. We have to take single blood cultures. But if somebody will give definitely two, definitely suppose patient is very sick, and in one blood culture, by chance coagulase negative, you get. Then all Salmonella E. coli will be remain inside. They will not come outside. <laughs> and how about using one aerobic and one anaerobic? That is same. You can use a, a one aerobic, one aerobic. Most of the even other hospitals they. Um, but we have not come across any positive of anaerobic culture positive. So, we use aerobic error. Many of the time when the patient is critical, the clinicians will write on the decision aerobic, anaerobic and fungus. Because they do not want to miss even the… Nee, see that the one is that uh, we use the bacterial alert blood cultures. The bacterial alert is, so we have a study I will show you also. There is a human single blood bottle, aerobic bottles you will get bacteria as well as the fungus. Even the blood culture yeast will grow more than less than 24 hours. There is no need for a separate fungal blood cultures. That is uh, that is uh, even Dr. Chakravati also, uh, Arunalaka Chakravati also I am very happy with the bacteria alert because the fungal is coming inside the uh, um, aerobic blood cultures. So, aerobic, anaerobic you can, uh, it is my hospital I, I convince the clinicians, it is not the clinicians who will convince. When I join before, they are also separate fungal bottle. I, there is no need for separate fungal. All yeast are going. So, after uh, three months, nobody even asks for a fungal separate bottle. So, how you convince if you are that that I am saying the good correlation between microbiology or pathology to the clinician is important. They, they will listen to you. They will not like uh, if you tell the reports much earlier. So, definitely they will listen to you.
So, infective chondrocarditis we ask for three sets of blood cultures. One is now, then after 45 to 1 hour, one set of PR blood cultures, and if it is negative, then another repeat set in 24 hours of blood cultures. So, there are three paired blood cultures. Three paired means six. Six bottles we ask. These are routine practice in our hospitals. So, timing of collection is important, but more important is the blood volume that is more than, more than 10 ml definitely we have, a, we have we have to go into publish we have already published one pair blood culture so second publication is coming around 35000 pair blood cultures data uh, uh, so that is coming up but the timing is important but uh, most of the time it is not being followed so this is the peak time so bacteria may label chills so after chills you can collect the blood cultures but timing is not properly followed but like in for the next spike of always but if you start antibiotics that is yeah, the important they if you wait for the next spike of antibiotic uh, next spike of fever you will miss on the, the golden chance the fast so no need because that's why practicing pr blood test is much important okay. the the concept uh, there is a tremendous positivity i'll show you the data there is almost two to three times positivity increase yeah. if you see on pr blood test what is the optimum Volume. So, minimum 5 ml should be there. Nice yes, Sandeep? That is there. Total. Total. Adult. 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 Ah, it goes up to 40. Uh, what is the bottle? Uh, we it has some bottle. Yeah. One so, bottle usually we get 36, 37 ml uh, level. 36. Uh, 36. The volume of the bottle after adding the blood becomes around 40. 40 ml. Yeah. So, usually we get 36, 37 ml. An adult bottle will accept maximum 10 ml. What I am asking ML. is what should be the optimum volume of blood sampled for a getting a good sensitivity of blood culture? 5 to 10 ml for adults. But total how much? Like paired you say that means 10 plus 10, 20 ml. Yes. So, what is the optimum blood like the, the other guidelines say it should be minimum 40 ml of blood should be sampled. See. No, no, that is a CDC, uh, that is a CLSI, uh, CDC guidelines, CLSI guidelines says, yeah. but that what is, is not possible, experience? that is not possible. <laughs> See I the have been insisting, but uh, I am not succeeding. Is, uh, usually 10 ml. That minimum 40 ml should be sampled. No. <laughs> but I tell you my experience, even in, even in diagnosed enteric fever cases, when I insist paired blood culture, exactly because uh, I have learned this from Dr. Bansi only, aerobic paired blood culture. One bottle is salmonella positive, other is consistently negative. Huh. We, this is also. My experience, I have seen this, and that's how I, I tell the clinicians see, why I Hello? insist for a paired blood Hello? culture. Because if you Hello? have requested only one, then probably we have Meeting. we would have missed this. Meeting. So the volume of blood that is sampled for uh, blood culture is very very important. So even what is the true pathogens, single positive is. E. coli, salmonella, yeast, capsilla, all are true pathogens. Out there of two, one is blood cause is positive. Similar. Yes, but purely wise, I, from my experience, the thing is to take aerobic and anaerobic. Since the anaerobic will not do the anaerobic, they will go to gram positive. Yeah, Peptostreptococcus. Yeah. Peptostreptococcus. There are disadvantages. We have done, yeah, we are a, doing aerobic aerobic. But anaerobic peptostotokai, how much we are getting? We are not getting much. That's all. Not anaerobic. Because we were aerobic. Ha. Aerobic. Ha. Aerobic streptococcus will get anaerobic. So aerobic stota. Yeah. Ha. Cost effective. Nee. Only aerobic. Better to take two aerobic bottles. Because I asked about anaerobic. I've got better results with anaerobic because it's a cardiac hospital. Yes. Yeah. So for gram positive. Gram positive endocarditis. In endocarditis. So, so that I am saying for a specific departments like you can use, but in average general uh, we aerobic aerobic we are using. No, no, no at a single time at single time because uh, you have to also send to the lab also no? at the same time immediately. So, these are the blood culture collections, uh, these are some data uh, overall. Uh, no, 
So, we have definitely better collection procedures. So, one thing is that more than 50 percent of fever is not because of infections. These clinicians should understand the more than 50 percent it can be antibiotics also, lot of inflammatory reactions. So, there is most even up to 70 percent they know do not need antibiotics. This is the time from onset of hypertension to the so, as earliest you have to administer the antibiotics, they are more. So, we will not wait for the peak of the fever. So, we have to definitely uh, give the blood cultures. So, we cannot wait <laughs> for the peak. Timing and volume is more important than timing, as I already pointed out. Volume, if you less, but somehow, like in, in my neuro neurotologist, they are very happy like whatever they expect, whenever they expect we got positive results. So, they are giving good amount of blood, but like the what we are using the bacterial alert in the last 7, 8 years and there is no single complaint of neonatologists. Whenever they expect if something will grow, we have ever we have grown. No, no, I, yeah, yeah. Suppose in central line they give up to 5, even 2 blood cultures they give. Yes, 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 take it. Usually, 1 to 3 ml, we, but we whatever the sample they usually they do not give. <laughs> that is what our they are they get they get one 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 yeah, where they will get, where, where they will get, but, then, uh, yeah. but in 1.5, we have recovered, we have a good amount of because whenever you release antibiograms, we, we I send definitely ICU wise. ICU wise every 3 3 months all ICU ward wise I send the antibiogram and in annually I club then IPD ICU but in individual ICU there will be organism incidence from each ICU and wards where the web isolated. So, I neonatologists they have good whatever they expected. So, how many sets or set is defined by number of independent manufacturers. So, 3 blood culture sets they are as per uh, CDC basically CLSI guidelines, PU, infective endocarditis and fungemia, they ask for, th so what we only practice three sets in infective endocarditis, uh, not even PU also we should send three sets, three sets of paired blood cultures, even fungemia also, because the yield is less, so they are asking three sets of paired blood cultures. So, Second, another is how to collect from the center line using two separate alcohol preps, scrub catheter hub connections for 15 seconds with 70 percent alcohol. We only recommend 70 percent alcohol, otherwise, if you use chlorhexidine, then the organism will die, basically, even yeast also will die. Then, air dry, then collect the samples. So, initially, some, some are saying it discards few volumes, but now they are saying no, there is no need to discard any amount of blood from central line before putting in the blood culture bottle. So, do not send samples from the central line alone, if you send from the only from the central line it is difficult to diagnose, it is a pure sepsis or it is a central line colonizer, if you send two then we can identify it is a central line associated bloodstream infections or it is a primary bloodstream infections. They do not send central line tip alone, even also we do not accept central line tip in especially on pediatric CTBA surgery. So, sometimes they are not uh, they start antibiotics early, so same sometimes they send CVV tip, otherwise we reject central line tip. Always be compared with the peripheral blood cultures, do not send central line tip as a routine, we do not ask for central line tip cultures, they are basically a colonizer. Now, the CDC has clearly defined if a patient's blood culture is positive and it is true pathogens, so it is sepsis. There is no clinical symptoms or hypotension, everything is required. If it is a blood culture positive, means it is sepsis. Initially, there are a lot of things biochemical, everything is there, but now laboratory confirmed bloodstream infection, true pathogens, sepsis.
you treat. So, acceptable contamination rate is 3 percent. So, definitely we should have less than 3 percent. So, how a collection of samples vigorously clean 70 percent mainly basically these are the for the phlebotomy purpose clean wait for 3 pool uh, 3 full minutes and do not palpate areas with same gloves. So, these are the mainly for the phlebotomist how we collect the samples. So, these are the pubidone iodine then chlorhexidine 30 seconds is sufficient. So, we do not have to. So, chlorhexidine is superior we have to use a chlorhexidine. Do not refrigerate the blood culture bottles. What happens one day one small hospital pediatric hospital. So, I went. So, there was an outbreak of Klebsiella pneumonia. So, the NICU ward they have uh, he was my friend he is from Fiji Chandigarh also he is a good hospital name good hospitals. So, there are four patients got MDR Klebsiella infections. So, so I go got and check for audit as a personal uh, he has invited me. So, then he was saying he all the blood culture bottles even the pre sampling bottles are was there in the freeze post sampling bottles are was there in the refrigerator. So, this is the so we should not keep uh, blood culture bottle in the refrigerator. Do not refrigerate even after inoculation there is a questionnaire I think from the that biomary also there is a questionnaire do not refrigerate even after inoculation keep at room temperature not to be incubated at 37 degrees Celsius. If you if uh, there is a transport and delay also if there is an incubator please do not keep in the incubator. What will happen if there is a small then there is a growth start starting then again you are transporting then a lot of growth innovation again in the bacterial bottle this will give false positive. Transport within 2 hours. So, use use resin containing medium if patient has received prior antimicrobial therapy. So, now I think it is a routine resin based blood culture bottles. One cent properly collected do not repeat for 5 days. We only recommend the blood culture to be repeated only in staphylococcus endocarditis and uh, in endocarditis and staphylococcus in, in patients and sometimes pseudomonas. Otherwise, we do not ask for repeat blood culture, start treatment, there is no need for repeat. Sir, uh, does any of those references mention that do not repeat for 5 days? Because we encounter this problem basically in neonatology, they send the third day. So, if we can convince them to wait for another. It is clear uh, guidelines in CLSI guidelines, CLSI guidelines blood culture you can see. Okay. If you do not have CLSI guidelines blood culture, you can just see and the other child forward. The there is a clear and only two conditions you have to repeat that two after five days is staphylococcus bloodstream infections or endocarditis. Because if the culture is positive and an antibody sensitivity is there, they should treat. Why to repeat third day cultures? This concept is coming up like send third day culture, ET cultures, everything, urine culture, why? So, the ideally the it should be reached to the lab in the 2 hours, but if if it is not there then you can transport during transportation we are saying there are 2 conditions it should not be refrigerated or should not be incubated. The ideal room temperature is ok not a problem it is, is the in the 2 hours it is 2 hours. See what will happen? We have a now as given study also there are gram negative baseline, gram positive baseline and yeast. The time of positivity of the blood cultures starts from usually 11 2 hours to 24 hours, but if you delay then blood culture positivity will be 48 hours even 36 to 48 hours even beyond. If you keep the bottles in 2 hours definitely if your gram negative is like definitely you will get in 16 hours or 24 hours gram negative. Gram positive you will get definitely positive within 36 hours and yeast also less than 48 hours. 
these are our study which we have analyzed that gram negative comes earliest positive, then gram positive and east. Then if you delay in the transportation, then definitely your, you expect your results. So, the, uh, that, that is the, that will be there, this, this will be happen, these are pre analyzed things. In a hospital setup, we immediately put and we will give immediately later. That, that will be, but at least you are giving 48 hours, that is important also, we are not giving 7 days. No, but we have no no, no need for incubation yeah. because if we we'll put in the incubator, it will give false positive. Okay. Yes. False positive. Yes, because why the bacteria start growing in the incubator, but then from the incubator you are putting in the uh, machine. So this is the difference. So there may be some false positive earliest without before positive also culture growth. It will give our alarm. So, you are putting in multiple incubator, one is normal incubator and that is a bacterial alert incubator. So, it there is, you should not, this is a very important quiz also they have asked. One quiz I have attended that by my school is micro corner, so they have asked this question. So, I could not answer that. <laughs> So, the amount of blood is important. So, so this is the one study where a surgical branches, medical branches, ISO adult and pediatrics. So, this uh, less adequate and more. So, so pediatrics, so most of the thing they have sent the less volume. Hmm? There is to emphasize the fact that optimal blood volume needs to be added for higher sensitivity. So, these are basic requirements completely filled TRF, center line, peripheral line, uh, septically collected, blood culture, timing, volume, patient is on antibiotic or not, everything has to be there in the report. So, you can, you can otherwise. So, automated blood cultures machine, this is the bacterial, uh, we also use this blood culture bottles examined continuously. This machine is automated uh, things and uh, every 10 minutes the machine detects there is a positive or negative every 10 minutes. And then they give a alarm also there is on the color changes of the bottle and there is a continuous agitation of the cultures I think that increases the growth rate faster detection higher recovery. So, after uh, 5 days the bottle will be declared negative both for aerobic both for anaerobic and fungal also even fungal some say 14 days, but automated blood cultures 5 days is sufficient. Even the yeast also they maximally they grow less than 48 hours. Yes, 
So, clinicians how you convince that is more important. I gave the same example. Yes. So, it not only the blood all sterile body fluids including CSF, acetic body fluids, pleural fluids most of the cases also we got com positives. And uh, sometimes uh, I should not that is not in the book also like what the one example unofficially one I saw uh, a director send me in the, the urine cultures basically the, the urine cultures. Actually what happened the patient is not able we not able to find out where the yeast is coming in the blood. So, he told me once, once I want to send the urine in the blood you please accept that. I accepted and the urine culture grew yeast. Surprisingly normal urine culture was not growing but that blood culture grew. So, we have to report because he was saying found a, he was thinking there is a renal may be the source, but ultimately the blood culture would not grieve waste. But this is not in the guidelines. So, we <laughs> so infective endocarditis we have already discussed three sets of paired blood cultures. So, these are the conventional and automated dispatch positive report in three days, automated 70 percent within 24 hours, maximum 36 hours and uh, these are the reports uh, and de-escalation of antimicrobial therapy only after 40 days definitely you start. What clinicians say they send procalcitonin, blood cultures and start empirical therapy. If after 40 days fever, there is no fever, sepsis, so they stop antibiotics also, narrowing of antimicrobial therapy, economic benefit, first of organism isolations, even also hemophilus influenzae we able to grow in blood culture bottles. Meningitis patients also both meningitis and sepsis, hemophilus we have reported in the blood culture, yeast yes then CRBSI like the, the time difference between center line and peripheral line that will also the automated blood cultures. This is the difference in time of positivity, this is one interesting thing the growth of microbes from the blood sample drawn from catheter hub at least 2 hours before the microbial growth detected in the blood sample obtained from peripheral and base difference here by saying. If you want to know this the source is center line, see the center line and the peripheral line same together, but the center line indicate positive 2 hours before the peripheral line. So, in that case you can say and the source is center line, otherwise it is a peripheral. No, we do we go the regular rounds. So, this concept is there, but mostly they are being not followed. They send center line and periphery, we also report both are positive. We do not mention the center line comes to our positive. Yes, it should be, but because we get a lot of blood cultures, every day almost 100 patients' blood cultures. So, it is not possible for us. But this is a good concept in a small hospital if you give, they will much happy. Right? And they will immediately remove the center lines and say 50 percent more than 50 percent that is more important they remove the center lines, especially in Canada you have to remove the center lines plus antifungal then will it will help. Why blood volume is important single most important variable for determining bacteria increase the percentage of pathogen recovery and decrease the time of positivity. If the blood volume is high then the positivity will be almost 12 hours, 13 hours, which usually we get in 16 to 24 hours. And turn around time, increase detection and volume patients. So, direct relation between the volume culture diagnostic yield and the volume blood taking. When the blood volume is increased 2 to 20 ml, the yield of positive cultures increases 30 to 50 percent. This is the, I think you are asking about this. Na? See increase sensitivity, correlation of increased number of bacterial introduces the bottles and rapid detection uh, produces results with the bacteria in more than 1000 colony per unit per and decrease time to positivity. See in our study, so any culture positive we have minimum 10 to the 3 colony count. Correlation of increased number of bacteria introduces the bottles and rapid detection of even also normal routine cultures also if there is a bacteria of 10 to the power 3 then only cultures come positive. And this is gram strain hai, if you 
see uh, 1 gram stain in the oil immersion field means it is a 10 to the power 4 10 to 5 any gram stain any gram stain urine may if you do a gram stain and one bacteria that is equivalent to 10 to the 5 colony count. Can we apply the same uh, principle? I am just highlighting the same principle of center and peripheral. If the patient is on uh, chemotherapy port, that is the center line. Same center. Uh, the chemotherapy port is accessed every two or three weeks, depending on what chemotherapy cycle is. And the chances that the patient might get infection in the previous cycle and it might come in the next cycle. Definitely. So, Chemo port or center line, okay. yeah. HD catheter or center line, but we usually in our HI data tracking, we have only kept if a patient is hospitalized, if that one month, within that one month, if it is come positive, then we take CLVSI, otherwise he is going moving here and there, we do not take. That is uh, your decision. Uh, no, no, we, we put up to one month after insertion, after the insertion of HD catheter or chemo port, up to one month your patient get the infections, so we take plebs. After one month, even it stays for months, so we do not take. Okay, so, we can take it into hospital acquired till one month and then? We usually, our, 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 we have automated tracking record. Okay. So, once anything on center line, any culture positive, automatically our CPRS will tell, our HIS will tell, uh, it is a clepsy and even VAP also. Any any culture positive on ET or uh, cultures after potatoes, it is automatically comes. We have a built up that uh, software. So, the blood will increase the recovery of increasing number of cells. The the even that if the in states are increases 1, 2, 3, then the detection of sensitivity is also increases. This is another study. Because lot of transient bacteremia like fever, when is there is a peak of fever, the yield. So, if you have multiple sets, definitely the recovery rate is much higher. This is a proven statement, blood volume is more most critical variable in increase the recovery and sensitivity increase the total volume of blood collected, increase the number of positive diagnoses. So, lot of papers, so blood, lot of papers, uh, gram negatives and pseudomonas are very sensitive to blood volume variation. So, prevention blood volume is most critical variable in decrease the time of positivity, yes. So, if blood volume is more, definitely you will get earlier positivity. So, these are the recommendations of adults blood volume, as I was asking there number of blood set episode 2 to 3 sets aerobic anaerobic aerobic anaerobic. So, these are uh, 10 ml per bottle. So, you are asking you are asking 10 ml per bottle 20 ml per set is 40 to 60 ml and at least 2 sets. Two sets. So, up to 20 ml they can there in the USA these are the USA CLSI guidelines. So, USA anti uh, microbial stewardship uh, anti microbiology. 20 to 30 ml, they ask ICMID, European, uh, European Congress, they are saying 8 to 10 ml is the optimal. So, there are a lot of variations. USA, they are saying up to 20 ml, but European, I think 8 to 10 ml per bottle. Sandeep? Yes, sir, but ultimately, the, it, you need to comply with the kit insert of the system you are using. Ah. So, like in bacteria, it is 8 to 10 ml. So, minimum 8 ml should be collected. So, it is 2 bottles, 16 ml. Four bottles and 30, 32 ml. So, 30 oh. ml as that you are saying, sir, is something uh, you should target so that uh, you can have up to four bottles. Four bottles. Right. right. So, 8 to 10 ml for uh, is the ideal. But you, on average, it is 6 to 7 ml which we received. We started doing lots of audits, and that helps actually. Yes. In order to improve blood culture collections, what we did is we, we started asking all our phlebotomists to write their names on the bottle. And whenever I grew a COAG negative staff, I called the phlebotomist just in my section just to tell him that we have grown a COAG negative, negative staff from a blood that was collected by you. Go. Even this much oh, helps. Yes. We have to make them conscious that for their little bit of carelessness in skin preparation, 
uh, amounts to such a negligence. This is very important. This makes them conscious. Another thing we started also measuring the volume of blood collected each blood blood culture bottle. Phlebotomy wise. And we again educated them and tell, told them that, see, you are the guy who is collecting less, whereas the others are collecting good. See, their yield is better, yours is not, so they become conscious. So, sir, you write down the name of yeah. the bottle, so yeah. who is collecting, yeah. and you weigh the bottle for volume? How no, there are mass there. Are. It is coming now, 37 ml, 37 ml, so you were saying 40 ml. No, sir, 5 ml. We are seeing 36, 37 ml average. Hai. Definitely, this is a very good thing. Different ministers are take different measures to know the volume. Sir, bottle me likha hua hai na. So, our 36, 37 ml me abhi study kar raha hu. 30 ml is media. So, you get almost 36, 37 ml. Now, uh, we are doing. Uh, so, recommendation of pediatric blood volume uh, to be cultured. It is a, this is your question, I think. The blood volume to be drawn should not exceed 1 percent of the patient's blood volume. Optimize the balance security of the patient's recovery of pathogens. Adequate blood volume 0.5 ml per pa patients less than 1 month of age, 1 ml per patient between 1 month and 36 month of age, 4 ml of patients more than 36 months of age. This is the ideal. So, it is around 0.5 to 1 ml. Then on the individual basis, volume can be based on the patient weight and hematocrit, right. So, low staff awareness, that is your uh, staff awareness is also important. So, this is what, what Sandeep, this is what volume of blood should be collected on one bottle. Overall, 79 percent of the interviewers, they think that blood volume needed should be less than 10 ml. Overall, 90 percent of the nurses think the blood volume needed should be less than 10 ml. So, uh, this is a question as they ask all the staffs. Overall, 40 percent of the interviewers think that blood volume needed should be less than 5 ml. In even 50 percent, they do not know how much exact amount of blood. Overall, 50, yeah, this is a questionnaire. Yes. Overall, 52 percent of the nurses think that the blood volume needed should be less than 5 ml. Overall, 21 of the interviewers think that the blood volume needed should be less than 1 ml. <laughs> <laughs> Need to improve the knowledge of blood culture based practices to improve the performance and time of research. This is very important. So, blood volume collected in routine practice recommendations are not followed. So, say all this blood volume already discussed, the optimal blood volume is not respected in the public, 65 percent of bottles are underfilled. Actually, that is correct, 65 percent of bottles are underfilled. So, blood volume collected in routine practice recommendations are not followed. The blood volume collection varies from 0, 0.3 to 22 ml. The optimal collection volume is not respected in routine context. So, this can be, this is a education needed for improving blood culture bottles. Initial audit, this I have said. Initial audit after introduction, post color photo memorandum, 3 m post all this audit and education. Are you using vacuum trainers for collection, collection of blood color? No vacuum trainers. But there are adapters available for the ah, yes, adapter. Adapter is there. That. Adapter is there, and uh, we are in collecting syringes, not in vacuum. The bottles are not vacuum, but you know, yeah, we get good amount of that. Ah, adapter yeah. is there. Yeah. We have the adapter, and we are using it quite quite successfully. So adapter will be sterilized between two. No need. There. There is. Still, they can be used. Yeah. Yes, Sandeep, you were saying something. Sir, ma'am, earlier adapter, there was a problem that the, the vacuum tubes used to not fit on the bacteria alert adapter. Mm -hmm. But now we have new adapter yes. on which vacuum tubes and bacteria alert both, both can, can be yeah. fit. At one go. At yeah. one go. Like At one, one after other. One one after after definitely other. that will also. So in the, same, the design is such that. It's narrow on the top so that vacuum tube can go, and then wide at the bottom, that wide bacterial bottle can yeah. go, and the syringe thickness is enough to meet the both. Yeah. So that can also be helpful. So recommendation for an adequate blood volume monitoring, or recommendation for the so in adults at least 20 ml per per. So this varies, like 8 to 10 ml we should take at least. Blood volume single most important variable. Blood volume the most critical improvement. 
the so, laboratory should monitor collected blood volumes and provide the feedback to clinical staff, increase awareness of the appropriate blood volume collection can impact the true positive blood culture rate that is should give feedback. So, comparison of guidelines number of sets 2 to 3 sets timing. So, to this USA then European guideline 2 to 3 sets France 2 to 3 so almost 2 sets timing of uh, blood culture time uh, positivity blood culture less than 1 hour. So, then only 15 minutes ok. So, you can time of blood culture between 2 sets within 1 hour also you can give at same time usually recommended, but within 1 hour you can because you, you have to send the samples to the lab and you have to bill for payout that means you have to send 2 bottles otherwise it will be bill for 1 bottle. So, volume of blood episodes so 8 to 10 ml will take that is final time to incubation so within 2, two hours 1 to 2 hours so the, that is our final incubations room temperature room temperatures room temperature all are room temperatures not in refrigerator not in incubator examination gram strains yes gram strain as soon as possible at least every 8 hours are uh, no, as soon as possible length of incubation 5 days 5 days will follow 5 days. So, this is the article uh, we have published in 2012. So, initially when I joined this the collected the data that was published in 2012. These are the paired blood culture data, comparative evaluation of paired blood culture versus single blood culture along with clinical importance of catheter versus peripheral line. So, gram negative was 82 percent positive, gram positive 10 percent, fungal 8 percent and the time of positivity is almost less than 24 hours. How much? It is uh, yeah, yeah 11.4 percent and 24 to 36 hours is maximum 63 percent. 36 to 48 hours. So, depends on the how immediately it is transported to the lab between collection and intubated in the system. So, all depends. Time it is loaded. So, a time collect the system itself. It is system bacteria automatically collects when you load when it comes positive it gives the time. So, we within 1 hour 2 hours so we sample get. So, single blood culture of only positive 4 percent true positive and whereas, 13 point 7 percent on pure blood culture positive. So, definitely much higher positivity. That time only we have studied 2553 pure blood cultures. So, these are some guidelines on blood cultures, here are some other guidelines. So, thank you. So, if you have any more questions or I think we have already covered everything. So, what is the next T or we will go to next session? Yeah. So, it was a very informative talk and we will now break for tea. Yeah. Yeah. You have not expected that it will be finished. See, there are basic things. So, we are back to the basic things. So, what do you see when uh, Fletchella grows in fetal sample, community acquired in fetal Only in the primary well, what do you report? We do not report. A good sample. Our non official, unofficial, we have very standard protocols OPD, sputum. Possel is less possel less than 25, we do not report. Yeah. IPD? More than, more than, than 10. 10. Uh -huh. And you grow Clepsilla only in the primary well, which happens more often than not. Yeah. In a lot of so, insignificant. You insignificant. You would report it only if it grows in the, the, the last tree. Yeah, last tree. Otherwise, you would not. Otherwise. Canada, we do not report. Clepsilla also. Canada, some Sputum sample we do not report, we do not report. If a patients uh, elderly only in ISU, ISU patients we report authorize. Do you mention that you have grown it and your it is not significant or you do not mention it? Only? Sputum OPD, IPD in Canada we do not report at all. Only in ISU patients we report. Similarly in uh, sputum we have very clear cut OPD, IPD and ISU 
OPD usually we do not report unless there is very high parcels, parcel means up to 20, 100, 100 parcels and uh, otherwise uh, we do not report in OPD, IPD, IPD then we either most likely insignificant or moderately significant unless otherwise but in ICU we give Klebsiella because in the PCR positive also lot of hospital acquired pneumonia. Ten minutes. Minimum ten. You can start, sir. You can start. Then. Ah, not a problem. Discussion the chalta rahega. Sir, sure you can come to this side. an MD path and micro from MGM College Indore in the year 1984 and he's in, he has been an associate professor in the same college for 8 years. He's worked as a regional head of pathology for 14 years at Oman and he's currently working as a consultant and head department of lab and transfusion medicine in Greater Kailash Hospital Indore. His areas of interest include uh, micro biology, pathology, pathology and transfusion He's commissioned four state-of-the-art hospital labs in India and abroad and over 100 presentations in national and regional conferences and over a dozen publications in Indian and international journals. Among the rare cases that he's reported, he's reported the first case of tularemia from Southeast Asia and he's also reported atomobacter xylooxidans from a post-operative hernia infection and Shigella Sony from urinary tract infection with eight case reporting in the world. So I invite Dr. Suhas to speak. His talk is on antibi antibiotic sensitivity and drug resistance. Good evening, everybody. I hope you all are still fresh and have uh, your energy left over to receive me. Anyway, <coughs> as there are microbiologists in this crowd, there is also a pathologist in this crowd and there is also an upcoming microbiology PG student here. My talk will be somewhere in between. For some areas I will cover a little bit in detail, some areas I will just go by because all of you know th those things pretty well, but you can stop me and ask me if you want more details on that. If I am able to answer, I will, otherwise Dr. Bansi is always there. Well, friends, we are living in the era of evidence-based medicine and in this era, any important clinical decision is based on solid scientific evidence. We cannot now say chalta hai, we cannot guess anything, we have to give solid laboratory evidence for allowing the clinician to take a clinical decision and this requires us to be very, very accurate, very precise, reliable, relevant and efficient also. So all these things we have to consider as a responsibility towards the patient. We are working for the patient. I always tell my staff we are not working for the clinician. We are working for the patient. We are also a party in the treatment of the patient. If we have that attitude, then I think everything falls in place. We are also living in the era of killer bugs. You all are aware that almost 70 to 80 percent of our gram negative bacilli are ESBL positive. Almost 40, 50 percent of our staphylococci are MRSAs. We are the world leaders in multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, MDM one is gifted by us to the world. So we are a sort of a collection of resistant organisms and therefore a lot of responsibility lies on us to be aware of these organisms and to be absolutely clear and uh, precise about what we produce from the lab. Prescribing an antibiotic in such a scenario for the wise clinician is very tough, but I do find lots of clinicians who still are not so careful about prescribing an antibiotic and lots of them and it gives you a lot of pain. But for those who are wise, they always feel responsible and they always look at you 
for giving them the correct clues so that they can use those clues to treat their patient, to start an antibiotic or to hold it. Dr. Bansi also mentioned about this paper and I also couldn't resist mentioning about this paper from Anand Kumar which very clearly establishes that if an appropriate antibiotic is started within an hour of the setting up of septic shock, you have almost 80 percent chances of curing the patient. But every hour delay of starting the appropriate antibiotic increases the chances of mortality by about 8 percent. If you have delayed the starting of appropriate antibiotic by about say 6 hours, you have lost the patient by almost 50 percent. After that whatever you do right may not be right for the patient because you have already the damage is already done and organ damage has been done. Now whatever you do cannot help it. So such is our responsibility. The wise physician again is in a tremendous dilemma. On one side he knows that if he delays starting an antibiotic there is increased morbidity, there is increased mortality. But a lot of times starting an inappropriate antibiotic can lead to diagnostic confusion and of course it contributes a lot to increasing antimicrobial resistance. The WHO has very clearly brought out that more than 50 percent of the antibiotic prescriptions in all over the world are unnecessary and inappropriate and that is one of the main causes of increasing antimicrobial resistance. So delay or not to delay, hold or not to hold, start, when to start, what to start, lot of dilemma. Why ID and AST? Why do you want to know the organism and why do you want to do the sensitivity? You want to know the organism because when you know the organism you know what it can do to the patient. Every pathogen, every organism has its own known pathogenic potentials. When we see staph in our culture, the first thing we want to know is coagulase positive hai ki negative hai. Kyo? Because the moment you say that coagulase positive hai, you are alarmed. You alarm the clinician. It is positive. It is staph aureus. But the moment you say that, oh, it is coagulase negative, abhi inform mat karo. So you need to know the organism, what it is, because you can predict its pathogenic behavior. And to a large extent, you can also guess what would be its predictable behavior to different antibiotics. Lot of uh, organisms have their own known natural behaviors towards the antibiotics, susceptibility or resistance. So we can predict that. Plus we also want to know the organism exactly because then we can plan how to test its antimicrobial susceptibility because there are guidelines. For each organism there is a set of antibiotics that is to be put for AST. So we want to do that. Why still then we want to do AST? Because this kind of acquired resistance varies a lot. You find one E. coli in your lab the other day sensitive to all antibiotics except ampicillin and you wonder could this be E. coli in this today's times but you do get. You do get a Klebsiella even today which is resistant only to ampicillin and sensitive to everything and you start doubting oh ye Klebsiella hai ki aur kuch hai but hota hai and you get another Klebsiella sensitive to nothing. So the same species different strains have got different uh, and uh, levels of antimicrobial susceptibility and resistance. That is why it is very, very Im imperative that we do the exact antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Now there are methods that are manual, there are methods that are automatic. In most of my career has been spent on manual methods because automation came only in last 10 years. And when I was doing my MD, my entire skill was judged on how I used to uh, do ureas, how I used to you know separate the colonies from mixed cultures, how I could uh, prepare a VDR suspension. These were the things I was examined for and assessed in because we, we these manual things only were, were the skill of the microbiologist those days. But nowadays we have moved far apart. But let me tell you automation has come to our help and in a great deal but we cannot forget the manual methods. We have to know all the basic principles of manual microbiology. 
handling of cultures, inoculations, plating, gram stain, smear making, smear examination, assessment, everything is important. And simplest of these days like coagulase, catalase, all these things are important. And many times we must do parallel identifications and even sensitivities. So I do believe still that manual methods should not be disregarded and they should be taken as a second help even though you have automation. Now as regards automation, we have wonderful uh, equipment today, the Vitec, which gives us the sensitivity or the, the identification of an organism in as little time as four or six hours sometimes and maximum within an overnight period. And we can also put the inoculum into the cards and, and uh, just uh, put it into the machine and walk away to get the exact antibiogram of the organism including the epidemiological strain of that particular organism. So we got a great help. What we could not do in hours together is done in a minute by these automated systems. So they are a great help to us and if we can afford we must make use of these systems. We cannot do without this simple DST uh, test, the disc diffusion test, which tells us whether an organism is sensitive, resistant or intermediate to an antibiotic. The simple method of putting the discs onto the muller hinton agar and then measuring the zones of diameters and according to criteria interpreting whether sensitive, resistant or intermediate. I will come into little more detail later. We also have method, but the, the Malion method, the DST method tells us only whether it is sensitive, intermediate or resistant, nothing more. But we can exactly measure the MICs to have more information about the antimicrobial re resistance pattern. And the, the manual methods involve a, a bunch of uh, tubes in which you put serial dilutions of the antibiotic and test the fixed inoculum against these serial dilutions to know what is the minimum concentration of the antibiotic that inhibits visible growth of the organism that is called as minimum inhibitory concentration. In our diagnostic labs, in our busy schedule, we cannot do these tests, neither they are cost effective. But again, the automation has come to our help and the Vitec gives us cards which we can just simply inoculate with the inoculum and, and know the exact MICs of these organisms which give us lot of information. If we can't afford Vitec and all these big systems, a simple test like e-test wherein you get a strip with graded concentration of the antibiotic starting from the top to the bottom and then you plate it over a muller henten agar and then you find this, this zone of inhibition which is maximum where the concentration is maximum and goes on reducing and then meets the strip at a point which is the minimum inhibitory concentration of that particular antibiotic for that strain. So even if we do not have a specific uh, automated systems, such simple e-test, we can select for certain important uh, uh, tests wherein MIC determination is important. The job of disc diffusion uh, susceptibility test is a very, very responsible job. You may think that the interpretation is very simple, kya dekhna hai, zone of inhibition hi to dekhna hai. But that zone of inhibition ultimately reflects onto the treatment of the patient. And therefore, you must follow a strict discipline of the SOPs. And the SOPs are not too difficult to follow. We have the CLSI uh, uh, document which exactly tells you everything about how you should uh, do this entire DST test. You can download it from the internet also, if not this latest version, the previous version is freely downloadable in a PDF format and just go through all the st uh, steps and you can do exactly the same and you are, you are sure that you are following the exact <coughs> Covers everything, this document covers everything, which media to use, how to handle the discs, how to prepare the inoculum, how to inoculate the plates how to apply the discs, what to, how much to incubate, under what atmosphere, what temperature, how to read, how to interpret, how to do the quality control and what are the troubleshooting hints. So everything this document gives us, no need to go anywhere else and it is crystal clear. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, I do not think I need to go into the details, they are all uh, well known to us. What is important is this precision of testing, because if you report by mistake a resistant as sensitive, it is almost a criminal mistake, because you are allowing the clinician to use an antibiotic that is not going to work. One day somebody asked me, what is the costliest antibiotic in this world? So, I started you know finding out, meropenem nahi nahi wo ye ye. he said the costliest antibiotic is the antibiotic which does not work. So, we are not supposed to misguide the clinician towards an antibiotic which is not going to work, it is going to prove very costly to the patient. So, a resistant to sensitive error is very major error, sensitive to resistant is a major error, antibiotic sensitive hai. But we have resistant bol diya, clinician zyada zyada use nahi karega, dusra use kar lega. And then there are minor errors of labeling as sensitive or resistant to intermediate or yeah, intermediate ko sensitive is par ya us par kar do. This is a minor error. But remember about the major error. So, whenever you want to report sensitive, be 110 percent sure that it is sensitive. The CLSI and the UCAS uh, clinical breakpoints help us in deciding what are the criteria for labeling uh, 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 an antibiotic as sensitive or resistant or intermediate. And they are based on MIC distributions of that particular species amongst the various strains and they are coupled and correlated with the PKPD parameters and as well as the clinical outcomes. So, they are not merely the, the laboratory functions, but they are also very well correlated with the clinical outcomes and they are therefore, they are therapeutically applicable. So, a sensitive means an isolate that is inhibited by therapeutically achievable concentrations of the drug. Resistant means an isolate that is not inhibited by therapeutically achievable concentrations of that drug. And this is the guideline, I think all of us have it, all of us get it somehow, courtesy by Mario, courtesy uh, many others, we get and this document for each and every organism group tells us what is the medium to be used if we are doing the disk diffusion, what is the medium, what is the inoculum preparation, what is the inoculum temperature and time, how the reading should be taken, what is the control strain and how it should be used. And then it gives us systematically the zone diameters as well as the MIC criteria for labeling a, a particular antibiotic against the organism as sensitive, intermediate or resistant. UCAS does not define intermediate, so it becomes little risky, less than 22 is uh, re resistant, more than 22 is sensitive and now you are at 21 and then you do not know what to do. But CLSI is, uh, gives you a, this diplomatic window, wherein you can put that particular result into intermediate and be little safe, uh, give that ball in the, in the court of the clinician and for him to decide kisko use karna hai ki nahi, agar karna hai to thoda higher concentration mein use kare. So, I prefer using CLSI. We should understand MIC a little bit more. It is a measure of potency of a drug against an organism, because there are strains of a species with varying MICs and the sensitive strains have lower MICs, the resistant strains have higher MICs and the breakpoint MICs that we get from CLSI, they actually differentiate the sensitives from the resistant on the basis of as I told earlier therapeutically achievable concentrations of the drug. The basic principle in this application of these laboratory data into clinical medicine is that the concentration of the drug must be achieved at least 5 to 10 times that of the MIC of the drug. You should be able to achieve therapeutically in therapeutic doses sufficient concentrations of the drug into the plasma or serum, so that it is well above the MIC, well above the uh, MIC um, concentration. And sometimes you have an antibiotic sensitivity report, many times the clinician comes to me and says, aapke report mein main best antibiotic choose karna chahta hoon. To ek antibiotic hi jiska MIC 2 hai aur dousre ka 14 hai, to main ye 2 wala select karoon kya? I tell him, no, 2 aur 14 mein koi difference nahi hai. You compare the MIC of this particular isolate against the breakpoint. Suppose the breakpoint is 24 and the MIC of, of that particular uh, uh, antibiotic is 2, 
then it is very good. But if the break point is 16 and your, your antibiotic is 8, then it is just at the brim of becoming intermediate or resistant. But even then, even though you so precisely measure the MIC and give it to the clinicians, still there are lots of variations. For example, sometimes the drug concentrations vary because all these MICs are actually expressed on the basis of plasma concentrations. But there are drugs which achieve better concentrations in urine and bile especially when they are secreted through these. For example, tigecycline is secreted through bile or all the beta lactams are secreted through urine. So they achieve higher concentrations in urine. So similarly, on the other hand, uh, areas like CSF, prostate, abscess, eye, these are the tissues which achieve, uh, which achieve a very poor concentration of the antibiotic. And therefore, maybe the, you, you have labeled the antibiotic sensitive, but maybe it is unable to achieve sufficient concentrations to kill. There are certain antibiotics which have a very difficult, uh, di different pattern, uh, pardon me. For example, azithromycin, it achieves very good intracellular concentrations. And therefore, even if the MIC is not so favorable, it gives you very good results, particularly in cases of intracellular infections. Tigecycline, I mean, we have got treatment success in many patients where tigecycline was just intermediate. All other antibiotics were resistant but the infection was a soft tissue infection and it achieves good concentration I, and I went ahead and I, I told the clinician, use it, your patient will be all right and it did. So these considerations must be known to us, the behavior of the tissues towards the drug and of the drug towards the tissues. When should we do AST and when, when we should not do AST is very important. We should do AST when we find that it is a definite pathogen. It is a pathogen that needs to be treated and if it needs to be treated, we need to know what to treat it with. There are standardized methods available. There are breakpoints known and acquired resistance is prevalent. If these criteria are satisfied, then AST should be done. I will give you an example, streptococcus, group A streptococcus. Universally known, it is sensitive to penicillin. No need to do sensitivity. Even if you do it, it is meaningless. Tell the clinician, start, start penicillin. So there is no need. On the other hand, you have colonizers, you have commensals, you have contaminants. For God's sake, don't do it because if you do it, you are going to mislead the clinician. Or if standard guidelines or interpretive um, uh, guidelines, uh, breakpoints are not available, don't do it because you are going to mislead. Okay. There are certain absolute indications for MIC determination. For example, uh, critical infections like endocarditis, osteomyelitis, severe sepsis, meningitis, where treatment success is the basis for saving the patient. If you do not kill, if you do not achieve sufficient kill, your patient will be lost. And in such conditions, you have to give MIC so as to uh, enable the clinician to confidently use the drug and stick on to the drug. Organisms for which disc diffusion is not reliable. There are many organisms for which disc diffusion is not reliable and therefore we should not attempt to do, uh, for, the, for, for them disc diffusion is uh, contraindicated and for guiding therapy as in the case of uh, uh, penicillin resistant strep pneumonia against oxacillin. Yeah. Any of us, uh, like any lab is doing, like giving the organism and uh, sensitivity if requested, is like any comment, any lab? Never do it. Never do it. Many times clinician comes to you and says, I am erythromycin, laga raha hon, aapne kyun need kiya? You can firmly say this organism will not respond to this and it is not in the guidelines, better change the drug. I mean, you have to be very firm about your convictions and you should educate the clinician rather than, you know, simply, simply succumbing to his request. It makes no sense. Now I will sell slightly tilt my, my. Yes, we do. In the bracket. Like what? For example, I am not a more 
If you no, no, it is rather it is rather facilitating because if you report MICs and do not give him the guideline to interpret the MIC, आपने MIC लिख दिया two, लेकिन उसको ये पता नहीं पड़ रहा कि two को मैं क्या करूं? तो जब तक आप ये नहीं बताओगे कि MIC two है लेकिन इसका break point सोला है, तो उससे बहुत अच्छी है MIC. So earlier I was not doing it, then I thought it is worthwhile giving it and guiding the clinician to actually make an educated guess of each MIC that I have reported. So either give the MIC with the break points or don't give the MIC. Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically the MIC break points see some antibiotics have five, five uh, concentrations. Some MIC has only three concentrations. Like in the three concentration, it is less than two, two to four, more than four. In that case, like it is better to give the MIC breakpoints, but in that case, sometimes it will not give, like in the average, there are three concentrations, it is not like with the sensitive, intermediate and resistance. It is better, but it will not give also, it is okay, but some antibiotics like in the vancomycin, Important antibiotics. Like carbapenems, intermediate. In that case, MIC is therapeutically very important. MIC is 2 means you have to 5 to 10 times the concentration. The concentration of drug level of vancomycin is almost 15 to 25. Now, this is the concentration minimum required. 10 to 15 vancomycin level, microgram per ml is required to give a endocarditis patient. So, if it is less, and it's a failure. Absolutely. So, MIC's uh, expression is extremely important in critical infections and as with in relation to those antibiotics which have uh, a, a lot of de determination on the patient's outcome like vancomycin and uh, your and amino penicillin. Aminoglycoside concentrations. Yeah, aminoglycoside yeah. concentrations. Yeah. Carbapenems also. Yeah. If their MICs are, are towards the breakpoint, then you probably there is a there is an inducible carbapenemase or all. So, it no, gives you. The thing is that if there is free concentration, it MIC breakpoint is yeah. not much. But in the five concentration, then definitely it is. Then, then, yes, definitely, this, this you have to. Yes. 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 There is no problem for the unwise. He is very healthy. You can see it on the roads. Jisko koi chinta nahi, wo to wrong side se bhi jata hai, wo haste huye jata hai. Usko kuch nahi malum ki usne kya galat kiya hai. This is everywhere. A second thing, what we can, there is only oral antibiotics if the patients are on our patient, like some of the patients which we have separated. We can't take that decision. We have to give the choice. Let the clinician use it. We cannot. Yeah. Can't pick and choose. हाँ, बहुत ज़्यादा choice नहीं है हमारे पास. We do. Yes, yes. No, that dialogue really matters. Like Dr. Bansi said, that is the key. You have to call. If you don't wait for the clinician to call, you call and tell him that you do it. Maybe initially he'll feel कि ये बहुत ज्ञान बाट रहा है. But ultimately, it helps. It After helps. one or two months, you will see the result. Because as I told you, we are working for the patient. We are not working for the clinician. And that the has to be in our mind. Big buses. We are working so for the patient. Unka patient ko to karna hai. Those who are director or senior consultant, you have to call their patient. Even Salmonella also, they will be happy. Yes. Then definitely, this dialogue will definitely help. Now, I will shift your attention from the laboratory aspects to little bit more. 
because as microbiologists we have to come out of the lab as Dr. Bansi also mentioned and I also belong to the same ideology that we can no longer function effectively if we are only laboratory microbiologists we have to be clinical microbiologists. The problem in our country is that our country has maximum infectious diseases and minimum ID specialists because ID is a branch which is not that lucrative for the clinician. They want to become cardiologist, neurologist, this surgeon, that surgeon. So it is not a lucrative branch for them. So then what is left for our country? Either every physician becomes an ID physician which is impossible. So we as microbiologists have to come up and assume the role of a clinical microbiologist or so to say an ID physician to some extent. Until and unless we assume this role, I think we cannot perform ourselves fully well again for the patient. So we have to be a clinical microbiologist and I will always tell my colleagues that this should be the attitude of a microbiologist. He should read the event and collect the evidences in favor of that event. If he does not get sufficient evidences, he should look for more ask for more samples, get more smears made, review the smears, things like that. So you have to collect the evidence, completely study an event and then declare a result. It is this. Similarly, sometimes looking at one finding, you should be able to predict that there could be another finding. Something must be going on in the patient and alert the clinician do this. I am suspecting this. So you have to be a detective, you have to be an astrologer, microbiological astrologer. And for this you must know your drugs and you must know your bugs. So not only that you have your laboratory discipline in place, you have to go out and learn the therapeutics of antibiotics and the bugs in detail. Because the clinicians hate to know about the bugs. When you tell them certain name of Aridoxa, wo aap jano kya hai? So, I mean, we have to educate them that this is an organism, it does this, 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 itna sun lo, aapke patient mein ye ye kar sakta hai. So, unless we assume that role for the clinician, uh, nobody else is doing it. Now, what about the drugs? Very simple, there are two groups of drugs, the beta lactams and non beta lactams. Beta lactams are the major, there are four major groups in beta lactams, the penicillins, the cephalosporins, monobactams and carbapenems and there is a fifth BL, BLA combinations that is beta lactamase, beta, beta lactam, beta lactamase inhibitor combinations. And there is a whole group of non beta lactam drugs, aminoglycosides, macrolides, fluoroquinolones and many others. Penicillins started with the natural penicillins like penicillin G and penicillin V and how the antibiotics developed, we must understand this chronology that penicillin G when it was introduced, it was only in injectable form, it is in only in injectable form. We wanted to develop an oral form, so penicillin V was, was developed. But this natural pen penicillins had a, a major uh, action only against gram positives. So whatever are blue are against gram positives. So they had action only against gram positives. But on top of that, many of the gram positives started developing penicillin A's. So they starting actually uh, uh, hydrolyzing these antibiotics and making them ineffective. So there was a need to develop penicillin A's resistant penicillins. So we developed methicillin, oxacillin and cloxacillin. But still these penicillins were active only against gram positives. There was a need to increase the spectrum of the penicillins towards gram negatives. So we developed amino penicillins, which are ampicillin and moxicillin. They had good activity against gram negatives. But then there are organisms like Pseudomonas, Clepsila and all tough organisms against which these antibiotics did not show any activity. So we developed the carboxy penicillins and urido penicillins like ticarcillin, carbonicillin and piperacillins to have actions against Pseudomonas, Clepsila. Then comes cephalosporins, all of us know they are in four uh, generations. The first generation had predominant activity against gram positives. The second generation had major activity against gram negatives. But then came 
the need for the third generation. The, the need for the third generation was felt because most of these first and second generation uh, cephalosporins also succumbed to the uh, penicillinases and the cephalosporinases that the organisms started producing. So, there was a, there was a uh, battle of uh, bugs and drugs going on. Drugs were being invented, the bugs were inventing their own resistant mechanisms and for then run, running behind these drugs. So, the uh, hare and tortoise story was going on there. So, we developed the oximino penicillins, uh, oximino cephalosporins, cef, uh, the cefotaxin, ciftriaxone and all which actually were not inhibited or were not hydrolyzed by the uh, cephalosporinases. So, they were called as extended spectrum cephalosporins or oximino cephalosporins. Amongst them also antibiotics like ciftazidim and cifaparazone had profound anti pseudomonal action. So, that is how we got them, but then the organisms were very clever and they started producing ESBLs. We called them ESBL because they included even these oximino cephalosporins. So, once the ES the third generation cephalosporins were also gone, there was a need for those cephalosporins which were uh, not the substrate for the ESBLs and we developed cifepime and cifpirom the fourth generation cephalosporins which had more wide spectrum. So, the first generation had more uh, gram positive activity, the second and third generation the gram negative activity started increasing and the fourth generation cephalosporins again had both activity against gram positive and negatives and we have cefamycins which have activities against uh, anaerobes. We have monobactam that is estionam which has activity only against gram negatives. Okay. Then we have BLBLI combinations amoxiclav, MP selbactam, piptas, ticalclav and also in our country cifepirazone selbactam. And then lastly we had carbapenems. Carbapenems were developed and were cheered a lot in our medical uh, field because they could not be affected by the ESBLs and other beta lactamases. And there was a time when I, I was I used to read the guidelines of CLSI which used to say that if you find a gram negative organism which is which you find in your laboratory resistant to a carbapenem review your identification. Nowadays the story is totally different ok. So, that is carbapenem. Then you have the all other groups for example, aminoglycosides, amikacin, gentamicin etcetera. You have macrolides, erythromycin, azithromycin, clarithro, you have tetracyclines, you have clindamycin, cotrimoxazole, you have glycopeptides like vancomycin, tecoplanin, you have quinolones the first generation ones had more activity against gram negatives like nalidixic, ciprofloxacin and then you have levo and moxy which have more profound activity against gram positives and then you have linezolid, you have the peptides, daptomycin which is a prominent uh, drug against gram positives and you have polymyxins, the cholestein and polymyxin B and you have this wonderful drug tigecycline uh, which has both gram positive and gram negative spectrum. If you know about these drugs, their pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, it will help you interpreting your AST results quite a lot. The mechanisms of these drugs is pretty simple to understand. They act by one of the three mechanisms. Either they interrupt the cell wall synthesis like all your beta lactams and the vancomycin and the cholestin and polymyxins or they interrupt the nucleic acid synthesis. For example, your sulfonamides, your quinolones and the fampicin or they inhibit the protein synthesis. For example, all your other drugs like macrolides, clindamycin and the lanisolid, tetracyclines, aminoglycosides, etc. So, three mechanisms cell, cell wall synthesis, nucleic acid synthesis and protein synthesis. Amongst these the cell wall synthetic uh, synthesis uh, acting the beta lactams are actually bactericidal. Others may be sidal or uh, static depending on their activity. Then we have to know little bit about the resistance there is intrinsic resistance and there is extrinsic or acquired resistance. We cannot do anything about the intrinsic resistance. For example, all the strepto and staphylococci are resistant to drugs like nalidixic acid, estrionam, polymyxins. So, you should not put them in your test nor you should advise anybody. Proteus is inherently resistant to nitrofurantoin, cholestin, tetracycline, 
all gram negative bacilli are resistant to penicillin G or clindamycin. Enterococci are inherently resistant to cephalosporins, aminoglycosides, clindamycin, cotrimoxazole. Salmonella and Shigella, they are resistant to first and second generation cephalosporins and aminoglycosides and your pseudomonas is inherently resistant to ampicillin, amoxicillin, first and second generation cephalosporins, vancomycin, tigecycline and ertapenem. So remember these drugs and never put them in your AST if uh, anybody even asks you. Even why you are not given in emicacin in enterococcus? Educate him, educate him, it is important and the aminoglycosides against all anaerobes. Now you have the acquired resistance, this is where uh, your role starts, you cannot do anything with the intrinsic resistance, only thing is that you have to be knowledgeable about them and you have to educate the clinician. The acquired resistance is the result of antimicrobial use. The more we use the antibiotics, the more the bacteria undergo mutation in their genetic uh, machinery to develop resistance mechanisms against these drugs. And these resistances are transferred from one bacteria to the other with the help of plasmids. There are mainly four mechanisms again of development of antimicrobial resistance. Unfortunately, I am unable to use the Mm, it is not working, but uh, simply if, if you can see the diagram either they develop a enzyme which actually uh, hydrolyzes the drug. So, enzyme inactivation of the drug or they change the target site of the, the target action site of the drug. So, wherever the drug is acting they change the target. So, the drug is unable to act or they close down the doors for the drug or they lose the pouring channels which are actually the doors or the gateways for the drug to get in or they develop an effective efflux mechanism to throw out the drug even if it gets in. And the examples all the gram negatives mostly have beta lactamases, so they have their resistances mostly through beta lactams. The MRSAs, the VREs and the penicillin resistance strap pneumonia mostly have their resistances due to the change of the, the target site, the change in the penicillin binding protein. Similarly, the ribosomal target is changed for against antibiotics like tetracyclines, macrolides, etc. Then most of the pseudomonads demonstrate either decreased permeability or increased efflux by way of either porine loss or developing a efflux system. We must have an idea of what antibiotics have uh, what organisms have which prominent mechanisms of resistance. As I told you earlier, there are two classes of antibiotics by way of their behavior, bactericidal and bacteristatic. Why it is important for us to know? Because in a serious infection, bacteriostatic drugs are not going to work. The bacteriostatic drug will only stop multiplication of the drug, but will not kill it. You require the host defenses for the particular organism to be removed. So, if the patient is already critically sick or is immunocompromised, he is not going to have any benefit. So, that is the difference and therefore, we must know which drug is bacteriostatic or bactericidal against which organism. Little bit about PKPD, nowadays it is discussed quite a lot in the major conferences, but for our practical purposes, we must understand that antibiotics actually work by one of the two mechanisms, either time dependent or concentration dependent. That means, their action actually is dependent on either the time, the maximum time which they stay over the MIC during the dosing interval or concentration dependent, the maximum concentration that they achieve over the MIC during the dosing interval. We must identify these drugs. For example, the beta lactams have a time dependent action, whereas the drugs like aminoglycosides and quinolones and others have concentration dependent drug. And accordingly, there are PKPD indices. We do not go into the details, but just give you a, an example so that you understand these things pretty well. This is for, for, for beta lactams, the PKPD indices that are used in therapeutic medicine is T over MIC, that is time over. MIC that is the time for which the drug stays in plasma over and above the MIC level and you can compare between the two drugs and find 
that the drug A is better than drug B because it stays for a longer time above the MIC as compared to drug B. For example, the concentration dependent drugs particularly the aminocytes, the peak that it achieves, the higher the peak it achieves, the maximum kill it gives in therapeutic uh, effect. So, the C max over MIC is what is the determinant of a therapeutic success in case of concentration dependent drugs and area under curve, area under curve over MIC, area under curve means the area that is covered over the MIC. So, here both the dimensions are measured, the peak as well as the time, if you combine both then this is AUC over MIC. Now, we come to the bugs and this is, this is the reflection of the organism that I got in my hospital in 2015 which I have recently presented to my hospital, uh, 61 percent of the organisms that are recovered in cultures are gram negatives, 30 percent gram positive, 7 percent candida. So, it is emerging as a major pathogen and if you see the major organisms, you can see that if you minus that others 14, then 86 percent of the organisms that are recovered in cultures are only 8 or 9. So, E. coli, Klebsiella, Coag negative staph, Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, Candida, Enterococcus, Acinetobacter, Salmonella. So, I always tell my clinician friends, these are only 8 or 9 enemies, I think you take little more interest in them and try to know them as I do, so that you know we can, we can make a better team of fighting these infections, they are not so difficult. Okay. And now last part of my talk, I will just take you through some of the variables that we must use in interpreting the culture and sensitivity report. For example, every antibiotic that is reported sensitive may not be effective. You might be queried by the clinician, yaar tumne to diya sensitive lekin patient thik nahi hua. So, what are the variables? And the first one as I told you earlier is bactericidal versus bacteriostatic. Your patient is critical and your clinician is using choosing a drug that is not bactericidal. So, he has to use a bactericidal drug and not a bacteriostatic drug because there uh, it will not work. Inadequate dose, dose in relation to the body weight, dose in relation to the creatinine clearance. So, you have to go into those details to find out ki dose to kam nahi padra hai and then you have to assess the success non-compliance to the right dose, maybe the compliance is not there on part of the patient and then he comes back to you and says ki thik nahi ho raha hai and the clinician blame, blames you ki aapke report galat hai. So, you have to understand that these are the possible causes. Substandard preparation, believe me, a doctor's wife gets salmonella in blood culture, I gave and then he started on ceftriaxone and on the fifth or sixth day rather, he calls me and says yaar koi asari nahi ho raha hai fever jai nahi raha hai, tum ek baar report ko review kare hoge kya, ye kahi paradise hi to nahi hoga, mein ka kuch bhi nahi hoga, jo diya hai wo hi hai. Then what is the problem? I said kya use kar rahe ho aap, siftraxon, koon sa? Wo nahi mujhe malum. I said use a standard preparation, wo sample wala idhar udhar wala mat use karna. He changed the brand and she responded on the next day. Yeah. And nowadays in our market there are all kinds of cheaper drugs, antibiotics available which misguide the clinician and lots of uh, benefits they are given for which they are tempted to prescribe these drugs. So, we should, we should point out these things that substandard preparations actually bring failure to the clinician. And poor tissue penetration, for example, sites such as as I told you earlier CSF. If a drug is not crossing the blood brain barrier, prostate, abscesses, closed abscesses, eye, bone, these are the areas where the drug may not reach and although the drug is sensitive, it may not achieve sufficient concentrations. So, the clinician has to really work hard to achieve therapeutic success in these locations and then there are certain drugs which are being wrongly used because they never reach those locations. Nitrofurantoin never achieves good tissue concentrations. It is called as a urinary antiseptic. If you are using it for a UTI in a patient who is having high grade fever and symptoms of SIRS, how are you going to achieve success even though it is reported sensitive? 
So there you need to understand the behavior of the drug. Tigecycline should not be a drug of choice for septicemia because it does not achieve uh, sufficient concentrations even to the level of MICs and there are treatment failures reported and even in the CDC has actually raised an alarm that this drug should not be used for uh, septicemia. It is a very good drug for uh, uh, skin and soft tissue because it achieves very good concentrations. Daptomycin is inactivated by surfactant in the lung, so you cannot use this. Then the presence of foreign body, a very, very common situation. A patient is septicemic and you are given the report, patient is not responding. On the third and fourth day, the clinician calls you, the patient is not responding. I said, is there a line? He said, yes, remove the line. So I mean, source control has got to be thought of. Every treat, every in, uh, infective disease cannot be simply treated by um, antibiotics. So if there is a suture, if there is a catheter, if there is a prosthesis which is the seat of infection, any amount of antibiotic that you give is not going to work. You have to remove the prosthesis, you have to drain the abscess, you have to remove the catheter, you have to change the catheter, you have to remove the foreign body, suture, etc. Higher MIC of the isolate. I have seen many therapeutic uh, examples like this. Aminoglycoside, uh, your amikacin 16 MIC, borderline. Patient started using amy, uh, uh, um, amikacin, responded initially and then relapsed. You can see many of such examples, particularly when uh, organism has a higher MIC towards a particular drug and that drug is chosen for therapeutic use. And then using the drug in the wrong uh, dosing combinations. For example, as I told you, there are two types of drugs, the time dependent and concentration dependent and therefore, the time dependent action drugs should be dosed in such a way that they have prolonged infusions or frequent dosing. Whereas those drugs which are concentration dependent should be given in a loading dose and then you know they can even be given in a OD dose. Then there are inducible resistances. Now you need to educate your clinician against that and I prefer to uh, alert the clinician in my sensitivity reports itself that there is an evidence of inducible resistance and the treatment might fail if these antibiotics are used although they are reported sensitive. Staphylococci have inducible resistance mechanisms against penicillinase. So if you find a staphylococcus which is penicillin sensitive, doubt it 100 times. Okay. 